I'm here with Joel David Hamkins. Joel, thanks for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's start off with the concept of truth. Uh, This is a central concept in mathematics and elsewhere. And I think it's commonly believed that in uh, mathematics, mathematical truths are of a different character to truths in other contexts and in other fields. How do you think about the concept of truth within mathematics? Right. So I guess that it's not only the concept of truth that's different, really. The, the, the nature of existence is different in mathematics than it is in many other domains of knowledge. I mean, mathematics is concerned with what are regarded as abstract objects. In, in, in contrast with, say, physics and so on, which is concerned with mm-hmm. the nature of the physical existence, and it's a totally different character of existence, isn't it? I mean, <clears throat> you know, if you think about numbers, what, what is a number? What are numbers? Well, there are these, you know, there are these abstractions of a certain kind, which is maybe confusing to think about the nature that it seems different than the nature of existence of an apple or a few apples on your desk or something like that. Or, um, I mean, of course, we also have we also have abstractions in the physical world, like beauty, for example. Does beauty exist? Well, there's beautiful things, but uh, what about beauty itself? That's a kind of abstraction. And so, in what sense does the abstraction somehow re- does it reduce to the individual items that instantiate that concept? Or maybe the same thing's going on with numbers, right? And so, when one is talking about truth, it, it's just like another layer of abstraction, of course. I mean, if if we uh, you know talk about whether certain statements of uh, existence assertions about certain kinds of numbers, are there infinitely many primes, or is there a number Mm -hmm. such that it solves a a given equation, and so on. Then what does this exist? What does it mean? And and it's not (laughs) at all clear what we might mean. Vinasarath wrote a famous uh, article about what he viewed as a kind of fundamental problem about this abstract existence, namely the problem of causal interaction with this abstract realm. Maybe maybe one, I mean, of course, the idea of the sort of platonic realm of mathematics or of ideal forms is, is quite old. Uh, but the, the sort of problem with causality is that we seem to gain knowledge and make truth assertions about that realm, but how is it that we're able to interact with that mm-hmm. abstract realm at all? This is Vinasarath's challenge, right? It seems like... We, we can't seem to have any kind of causal, uh, uh, there can't be any sort of causality flowing in either direction, either from us, you know, as physical beings to Mm. the platonic realm or in the other direction is sort of this impassable divide between what we experience and the nature of the objects uh, in, you know, in that abstract realm. And so the, this was viewed uh, uh, as a kind of puzzle for how we can ever come to mathematical knowledge about that realm and ever make truth decisions about it, because we can't seem to get across this impassable bridge. Um, but okay, so a lot of people take this objection quite seriously. I mean, it's uh, there's hundreds of papers written about this idea, um, but other philosophers uh, often uh, um, uh, tend to reject the objection itself. For example, Barbara Montero. Um, argues uh, that it's not like we have such a great understanding of causality in the first place. Mm. I mean, causality itself, even in the physical realm, is quite mysterious. And if you think about sort of the problems of causality in, say, relativity theory, or Mm. um, uh, it's quite confusing. And, And so it's not at all the case that we have a perfect understanding of causality and that this unbridgeable gap between the platonic realm and our physical universe is a clear-cut violation. So it, it just seems like Vinasarab is relying, is he's making this concept of causality do too much in a way that uh, our imperfect understanding of causality just can't succeed that way. And so maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we don't have to take the objections so seriously um, mm. as, as that. Um, there's, there's other kind of issues, though, that come up with this abstraction uh, namely, <clears throat> it's quite commonly described uh, that the sort of difficulty of 
of the mathematical existence assertions has to do with their abstract nature. But if we could give a kind of account or reduce the abstractions to, say, physical assertions about the physical world, then everything would be good. It's somehow the, the, mm -hmm. this idea of somehow presuming that our our understanding and our accounts of physical existence are totally clear. And it's this abstract existence that's the worrisome one. But but I've argued that maybe that has it maybe we have it backwards uh, on that point because it seems like physical existence, the more physics you know, the the less clear <laughs> it is. I mean with the uh, uh, kind of strangeness of quantum mechanics and so on. The, the, the deeper you dig down into the fundamental nature of physical existence, the more kind of incoherent it is, even and mysterious. And, and it seems like we can't really give a very coherent or full account of the nature of existence of, say, electrons or, mm -hmm. uh, or, or an apple on my desk. I mean, if we really want to give a kind of complete account of what does it mean to say that such a thing exists. Um, whereas in certain simple kinds of mathematical existence assertions like the existence of the empty set is an example I like to use or the set containing the empty set, then it seems like we can give a, a pretty satisfactory account of what it means to say that the empty set exists. We can talk about predicates that uh, are impossible to instantiate and, you know, this predicate is... Uh, it, it is kind of the members, you know, the individuals that fall under this predicate are exactly you know, the members of the empty set. And okay, we can talk in this kind of way. And 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 it, it seems to me it's a sort of more comprehensive account of what it means for that abstract thing to exist than is possible. I can't even imagine the nature of a corresponding full account of the nature of existence of an electron, say, mm -hmm. in a way that was as complete. And so, <clears throat> so what I think is the mysterious one is physical existence and abstract existence is maybe much easier. So from this point of view, maybe these mathematical truth assertions are... Uh, a little easier to come by than the the true physical ones. Yeah, I think I think that de definitely connects with a lot of people's intuitions about mathematical truths, at least being somehow objectively more true in in a way, or um, more fundamental in some sense than these physical truths that you mentioned. But but it does strike me if you look at it like from first principles, even the physical truths, like well, we're using concepts to talk about them, and in some sense they are all abstractions that that live in some mental realm or some mind space, um, and uh, it's actually not very clear. Uh, it, kind of how to differentiate those spaces, right? You, you mentioned uh, electrons and, you know, an, an apple on your desk. Uh, those are just words um, f or ideas floating in my mind in the same way as a symbol on a page. And, um, you know, yeah, I think you're totally right. It's, it's uh, how, how does one then connect the idea in the mind to whatever it is it's meant to be referring to outside of the mind? Um, feels like there's a bit of like a mind projection fallacy uh, at play here. Um, but that leads me to, to the idea then, is it is it easy to mistake the actual truth value of something from our presumed knowledge of that truth? Um, so, you know, certain things might seem intuitively very clearly true to us. And, you know, intuition can, can take you so far. Um, is, is it, do you think it's a, it's a common problem to um, mistake that like the strength of intuition um, of of something's truth value for the objective truth value out there in either the the real world or the platonic realm. Um, how, how do you how do you think about that that role of intuition? In well, truth? it's really interesting that you use that word intuition in that particular way because uh, um, this is a common way to talk about this sort of historical rise of intuitionism. I mean, as the uh, intuitionistic logic. Namely, uh, in classical logic, <clears throat> it's typically thought um, that one makes a clear distinction between what's true and sort of our knowledge or reasoning about what's true. Mm. Right? Those are just totally different things. And there's this idea that, OK, there's a, you know, an objective nature to, the, to what's really true, sort of independently of what we might know about it or reason about it or come to deduce about it or observe about it or, or whatever. And so we have 
um, uh, kind of separation between ontology and epistemology very clear. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in intuitionistic logic, I mean, historically, this sort of more contemporary uh, mathematicians working in, in with constructive logic don't have this view, but the, historically the, the view seems in a way to mix up what's true with our way of coming to know what's true by, mm. by replacing truth conditions with what amount to assertability conditions. So in intuitionistic logic, for example, we, we only assert P or Q if we're also prepared to say which one. And mm -hmm. whereas in classical logic, of course, we can have a disjunction P or Q. We, we can positively assert that even when we don't know which one is true. Maybe we're going to argue, look, it has to be one or the other, because uh, um, uh, if both of them are false, then you know, we get a contradiction or something like this. And, and whereas in intuitionistic logic, uh, the, the sort of assertability criteria would be um, that you assert the disjunction only when you're also prepared to assert one of them. And, and there's this way of viewing that as mixing up the concept of truth with the, co with the concept of sort of knowledge or our way of coming to know the truth. Um, but as I said, there's, you know, that, that, that's also true for other, the other logical connectives in intuitionistic logic. And, um, but there are, it's also this sort of independent contemporary program of using constructive mathematics in topos theory and so on. And, and the, in, in that situation, it's, it's not so much uh, mixing up epistemology and so on. It's rather just the nature of truth in these non-classical mathematical realms obeys intuitionistic logic and so they're calculating with that logic because that's the nature uh, of, of truth exhibited by those mathematical structures and so it's not burdened by this kind of uh, philosophical objection that I was just making. Mm -hmm. It does It does lead very naturally then to the question of how we do know um, that something is, is true or not true. Um, and uh, on the one hand, um, you know, you hope that at, at times those two different ideas, you know, the ontology of something and the epistemology coincide, you know, our intuitions are, str are strong enough and clear enough that we can trust them and uh, we, we can trust them to indicate something that's true out there in the real world. Um, but I mean, a, a, another approach or another methodology or I don't even know what to call it um, in maths is proof, um, the, the concept of, of proof and the process of proof, M maybe taking a step back and just looking at that, that, uh, that concept in sort of zoomed out, uh, how do you think about um, the notion of proof or how should people think about the notion of, of proof in mathematics? Right. It's actually fascinating, a fascinating puzzle, I mean, problem to think about. What, what does it mean to prove something? Right. And <clears throat> if you ask mathematicians uh, what a proof is, I mean, mathematicians who haven't studied, say, logic very much, mm -hmm. but just are, you know, expert in mathematics, then they're often hard pressed to say exactly what it means to prove something. I mean, to, mm -hmm. to give you a, a definite account, you know, well, what they mean, you know, it's one of these things you recognize in practice, you give them. And, and, and what it's going to be boiling down to in the end is something like a very convincing argument that makes clear what the logical steps of reasoning are, or something like this. Um, and uh, for example, I wrote a book called Proof and the Art of Mathematics, which was teaching undergraduate students' introductory book, How to Learn How to Write Proofs. And in that book, it's not a logic book, and I didn't give a formal definition of proof, and I said a proof is a um, is a... Uh, is a clear and convincing argument that that logically demonstrates that the conclusion follows from the premise, and and uh, and it's sort of an informal definition, but it's workable in practice when mathematicians are writing proofs. That's what they mean. But in the subject of mathematical logic, uh, we have a concept of formal proof which is different from proof as it's used by mathematicians, because most mathematicians, when they prove a theorem, they're not giving a formal proof. They're giving a, a convincing argument that demonstrates that the conclusion follows from the, you know, as a logical consequence of the premise, but it's not a formal proof in the sense of mathematical logic. Um, but a formal proof is uh, one has to set up the uh, kind of context for it 
there's a formal language of mathematics in which these proofs are taking place. And so we have a definition of what counts as a formal language of mathematics. There's certain kinds of relation symbols and variable symbols and logical connectives and so on. And we can talk about expressions, formal expressions in this formal language. And then what a proof is, is a certain arrangement of those formal expressions uh, that, that constitute a proof. And, and so maybe the proof system, the formal system, there's a huge variety of different mm -hmm. kinds of proof systems, but in some of them we might have some axioms, some logical axioms, or then there's the axioms that we're going to be reasoning from in the proof. And then maybe there's some deduction rules that tell you, for example, one of the most common deduction rules is called modus ponens. And this is the rule that says, if you have a statement P, and you have an implication, P implies Q, then on the basis of those two statements, you can deduce Q. So this is a classical deduction rule. It goes back to Aristotle and so on. Um, and it's usually part of all, most of the proof systems. And, and so a formal proof is a kind of arrangement of statements in the formal language that either are using the, the, the formal axioms that were allowed, or at each step they're using the formal inference rules that were explicitly stated to be allowed, and such that at the bottom, at the end of the proof, is the statement, the theorem that's being proved. So we have this concept of formal proof. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the way I think about formal proof is something like the way I think about Turing machines as a model of computability. I mean, Alan Turing designed <clears throat> this sort of theoretical model of computation called Turing machines. In 1936, he abstracted away from what a human being did when sitting at a desk and undertaking a kind of computational process. And he was led to this idea of putting marks on a piece of paper and so on, and, and led to this concept of a Turing machine, which ultimately is is a kind of machine with a paper tape, and it can put marks on that tape, and it moves in very specific ways back and forth over the over the tape and looks at what it had previously written, and in, it's in one of finitely many states, and so on. And it, it provides a model of, of computability. And when you first learn about Turing machines, maybe you think, well, this is a totally primitive <laughs> kind of computer that could probably hardly do anything at all. It shouldn't be very useful. But Remarkably, it turns out, and Turing, this is part of what Turing had done, is he, he, he proved that Turing machines are amazingly powerful. And I mean, in principle, the kinds of computations that these very simple machines can undertake include simulations of essentially any kind of computational process that you can imagine using some other more powerful, say, computer language. If you, you know, the, the, the operation of Python programs or C++ programs or whatever, all of this can ultimately be simulated by these Turing machines. Okay, so why am I talking about Turing machines now? Well, the reason is that nobody uses Turing machines for actual computation. We study Turing machines as a theoretical model of computation in order to come to a deeper understanding of the nature of computation. And so this has led to a huge number of of insights and, and conceptual, you know, foundations of the subject in terms of the PNP problem and computability halting problem and the complexity uh, hierarchy and so on. All of these are based ultimately on the kind of theoretical framework that that model of computability provides. So we're not using Turing machines to compute, but we're using them to understand the nature of computation. And that's how I think about formal proofs. Not everyone thinks about formal proofs this way, but this is how, how I think, how I like to think about them. We don't use formal proofs to prove things. We use informal proofs to prove things. These are the, the informal proofs or the arguments that mathematicians use to understand mathematical ideas and to communicate with one another. But we use formal proofs to understand the nature of proof and the, the concepts of independence, logical independence and consistency and so on. These are the ideas that flow out of having a formal concept of proof and that provide a kind of framework of our understanding of the nature of proof. Absolutely. It, um, it, it reminds me of, it's actually sort of it's somewhat unrelated example, but I think it illustrates one of the, the points, at least of the utility of, you know, spending so much time studying a formal system and sort of 
abstracting insights up to some higher level system that would be used in everyday. So, for example, um, in uh, in natural language in speaking, um, the our intuitions uh, sort of coincide with um, uh, what you said that earlier about um, you know if if P implies Q and P then Q. I think that's that's a very natural thing to understand in uh, in everyday life, um, and yeah, including that in a formal system. Um, you know, the, the the example that came to mind was actually a, a fairly silly one, but I think it is called it's something like the 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 table theorem, um, and it's it's this idea. You know, you sometimes see someone sitting in a restaurant and the, and the table is wobbly. And uh, you've got a flat surface, and uh, they're sort of trying to gerrymander this this table around to try and get it to be static. But um, if you rotate the table, um, you know there, there will be a point at which you have three three legs all touching the ground at the same time. And it's again this idea of of you know at, at a very deep mathematical level, you can prove something about surfaces and three points, and it abstracts to something very useful in in the real world. Um, and again, the, the concept of you know you mentioned it, a Turing machine. I think it has it very has very much this this quality where <laughs> it's a it's a, an idea of computation that would be completely impractical to instantiate on an actual physical computer. No one would use it. Um, yet you can you can show that it can uh, um, you know the things that you can prove about the, the Turing machine would apply to computation that happens in in other contexts. Um, what what um, I always found very groundbreaking or sort of at least intuition bending about the concept of a Turing machine and some of the implications that, that come from it um, are um, the, the incompleteness theorems and, you know, the, the relationship between, you know, what you can prove about uh, whether or not a, a program can, can halt on a certain problem and, you know, what this means about being able to, to verify uh, statements you know, in, in mathematics. Could you could you set the the picture here a little bit? How one goes from looking at the the um, idea of a Turing machine to making it what many people consider to be considered to be a very profound statement about uh, verifiability in uh, in mathematics uh, and and in proof theory. Right. So so you mentioned the inconvenience theorem, but the question that you just asked is maybe more connected with the. Let's call the completeness theorem. So Gödel, it's sort of funny. Gödel proved <laughs> the completeness theorem, and he also proved the incompleteness theorem. But they don't contradict each other, of course. Mm. So the completeness theorem says the following: It says if if you have a theory, it's sort of a, a set of statements in a formal language. That's what a theory is, and it has a certain entailment. It it implies a certain statement, it's sort of. And I mean this not because there's a proof, but rather because it implies it logically in the sense that whenever in any mathematical structure in which the theory is true, then the statement also is true. For example, maybe you're talking, as, maybe we have a theory of certain kinds of orders of some kind, and we make a statement about, you know, of, in the language of orders, like that this, you know, that the order is dance or something like this. Uh, then uh, if every order satisfying the axioms ha- satisfies the conclusion, then that's what I mean by saying that the statement is a logical consequence of that theory. And the completeness theorem says, whenever a statement is a logical consequence of a theory, then that's equivalent to there being a proof of that statement in this formal mm-hmm. sense of proof. And it is just amazing that this could be true because it means, for example, if a statement is true in all groups, a certain kind of mathematical structure called a group, if a statement in language of groups is true in all groups, then there's a proof of it, a finite proof of it in this formal sense from the group axioms. And it is just astounding that that could be true because the statement about it being true in all groups is referring to this vast realm of different mathematical structures, including uncountable groups of enormous cardinality. And and the mere fact that the statement happens to be true in all of those different groups means that there's a proof, this finite combinatorial formal object. And the way I think about it is, okay, certainly if there is a proof, then because the proof system is a sound, you know, involves only sound reasoning steps, 
it should be true in all the groups. That direction seems totally clear. If we have a proof, then it's going to be true in all the groups, okay, in all the models of the theory, whatever the theory is. It's the other direction that's profound, that if it happens to be true in all the mathematical structures in which that theory is holding, then there's a proof, a reason. So it's saying basically that everything that's true is true for a reason. The reason is the proof, right? That, and I just find this remarkable. And, and it, it's, what, it's what's building the connection. The fact that the completeness theorem is correct is, is what's traversing the land from sort of this, this finitary land of proofs and formal statements and symbols that are being arranged in a certain way with the, the sort of semantic land of models and what's true in them, including these enormous uncountable models of the theory. And, and the fact that there's this equivalence, I just find it amazing. It's, but it's in a, a sense, just, just, oh, go ahead. It's just, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, I think if you speak to many mathematicians or people who are sort of familiar with mathematics, but have not studied it in the depth that you have, I, my, my experience is that the intuition falls the other direction. Uh, they find it, um, they expect that true statements will, will um, be provable. Um, and that, that, that seems to be a deeply held intuition, certainly in early years when people are studying mathematics. So I didn't mean to in interrupt you, but I would love to understand how your intuition on that point differs so much from at, at least my experience of, of speaking to people about this issue. I think there's a, okay, there's a difference when you're talking about sort of true, true statements being provable. And that is um, the completeness theorem is about theories that define a class of models, namely all the models of that theory, say all partial orders or mm. all groups or all lattices or, you know, whatever kind of mathematical structure you're talking about. You can often write down a theory and axiomatize that theory and, and you're defining the class of models of that theory. And the completeness theorem is about this kind of truth, meaning true in all the models of the theory is equivalent to being provable. That's what the completeness theorem says. But oftentimes, mathematicians are not working with this sort of class of all models of the theory. Rather, they're working with a particular structure like the integers or the real numbers or some particular, you know, the complex field or something like this. And, and those theories are not in general, characterized by a first-order formal theory. They cannot be because of what's called the levenhans scholem theorem and its sort of fundamental results in, in logic show that if, if a first-order theory has an infinite model, then it has a lot of different ones that aren't isomorphic to each other. So when you're talking about a particular structure, you can never, I mean, a particular infinite structure, you can never characterize it as the as you, you can never uniquely characterize it by a first-order theory. You can give these categoricity results in second-order logic. And for example, the integers and the complex numbers and the real numbers all enjoy categorizations in second-order logic. But the problem is we don't have a proof system, a sound and complete proof system in second-order logic. So there's no analog of the completeness theorem in second-order logic. And so that's the, the sort of issue is that if you're thinking about say the arithmetic truths and you want to know everything that every arithmetic statement that's true should have a proof from some fixed theory. Can't be a first order theory because, because uh, uh, then you're only looking at one model instead of the whole class of models of that theory, which is going to be enormous. And if you're looking at second order logic, then you don't have a formal proof system that's sound and complete and the completeness theorem breaks down. I don't know if that's clarifying or not, but it's sort of how I um, think about that difference. Yeah, no, it, uh, it, it is. It is. And um, I, I feel like you were on the cusp of, of something profound when I rudely interrupted. So um, let's, uh, <laughs> so let's, let's get, 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 get back to the amazing stream of thought. So maybe we should talk about the incompleteness theorem, which is the assertion, right, that that there are true but unprovable statements, say, in arithmetic. And what does that mean? Because I just said that every true statement is provable, right? That's the completeness theorem. And the incompleteness theorem says that there are true statements that aren't 
provable. But it's exactly this difference, because in the context of the incompleteness theorem, when we say there's a true statement, we mean it's true in the particular model of, say, the natural numbers, the, the standard model of arithmetic has the natural numbers and a zero and one are constants, and it has addition and multiplication and the order. And this is the sort of standard language of arithmetic that's used for the piano axioms. And uh, I mean, the problem, maybe it's natural to sort of go back to the beginning of the 20th century when the answers to the, many of these questions weren't yet known. And at the end of the 19th century, uh, Piano, based on Dedekind's work, had presented this beautiful theory of arithmetic using what's now called uh, the piano theory of arithmetic, based on Dedekind's axioms. Um, and and he showed us how on the basis of very few principles, but including especially the induction principle, uh, one can prove essentially all of the standard classical uh, theory of arithmetic. You can prove the infinity of primes and, and the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And, you know, sort of, you can develop the whole theory of elementary number theory on the basis of piano arithmetic axioms. And so it seems quite natural to wonder, well, maybe those axioms are complete. Maybe they, those axioms settle every question uh, in arithmetic. It could be. We can write down the list of axioms. You know, they're just all totally ordinary axioms you know, uh, about the nature of addition and, in, and multiplication and how they interact and so on, plus the induction principle that says if you have a statement and it's true at zero and whenever it's true at a number, it's also true at the successor then it should be true for all the numbers, right? That's sort of common induction principle. And, and one might wonder, well, maybe this theory is complete, right? And maybe. Uh, but it follows from Gödel's theorem. Gödel's theorem is exactly the claim that there can be no such theory that is whose axioms we can write down, which is settling all the statements of arithmetic. There can't be any such theory. So in particular, the piano theory isn't such a theory. And one way of proving that, and sort of my favorite elementary proof of the incompleteness theorem, I can give you a proof right here. Um, oftentimes when I teach mathematical logic, uh, I like to give you know five or six different proofs of the incompleteness theorem. But the first one I, I always give is based on Turing's holding problem, namely. You first talk about Turing machines and computability, as we just were, and you prove that the, the halting problem is not computably decidable. So this is the question. Given a Turing machine program and an input for that program, the question is, will it halt or not? So that's a kind of scheme of infinitely many different questions that we could ask. And, and to say that it's not decidable is to say that there's no program that will correctly give you the answer to all those questions. So there's no computable procedure that you can use that will tell you yes or no in all cases whether or not a given program will halt on a given input. And it's not difficult to prove that theorem because you suppose towards contradiction that there were such a procedure and then you design a certain program that... Uh, that asks about another program whether it would halt on itself, given itself as input. Yeah. It's kind of a weird thing to use a program as, an, as input to the program, but it's sort of understandable because the program is just this finite sequence of instructions, and so we can think of using that program as input to another program. So we make a, we make a program that would check whether a given program would halt on itself or not. And if the halting problem were decidable, then we could, we could answer that question. And then what we do is we make a program now which, given an input, it asks, does that program halt on itself? And if it does, then our program should do the opposite. So we're either going to go into an infinite loop or we're going to halt immediately in exactly the opposite way as the answer to that question. Okay, so now we made a program that does that. And then we feed that program to itself. And the point now is that that program would halt on itself if and only if it does the opposite to that, because that's how the program is designed. And that's a contradiction. So there can't be any such program. And therefore, the halting problem can't be decidable. OK, so that's basically a proof, Turing's proof, 1936 proof, of the undecidability of the halting problem. 
But now let's come to the Gödel theorem. Suppose that piano arithmetic was complete. But now, look, what we can do is design a procedure that's going to look for proofs in, that follow that theory, that flow from that theory. And we can design a procedure that will systematically try out all possible proof steps successively. So it's going to be basically enumerating all the possible theorems of those axioms, all of them, all and only the theorems. So it would be, it's kind of, I think about it as a box with a crank on it. We're going to turn this crank and it's going to spit out more and more theorems of piano arithmetic and it's going to spit out all the theorems, all and only the theorems. So now, if, if the theory were complete, then given any program and input, I can formulate the assertion that the program halts on that input. And I can turn the crank and see if that statement ever shows up or if the negation of that statement ever shows up. And if the theory were complete, one of them would have to be showing up. And when it does, I could answer the halting problem. That would be a computable solution of the halting problem. But that's a contradiction because we already argued that there isn't any such thing. So therefore, the theory cannot be complete. So this is a kind of reduction of the completeness theorem to the halting problem, right? And basically, there can't be a complete theory of arithmetic with a computable set of axioms, because if there were, then we could use it to solve the halting problem. But that's impossible. So that would be a contradiction. I don't know if that was... Mm -hmm. it, it, it absolutely is. And, and uh, again, for, for listeners who want to dig deeper, I think you, you do this very nicely in your set of lectures on, well, both in your book, but also your set of lectures online, which you very kindly uh, put up onto YouTube, which I've watched and enjoyed very much. Um, what, what strikes me as curious, very curious about this whole thing is, you know, that, that proof that you just gave is actually not that complex once you understand, um, you know, once you understand the concept of a Turing machine, once you understand that um, the, the proof of the, the halting problem, um, it, it follows quite na naturally this idea of incompleteness. Uh, yet, if you look historically at the the context, you know when this was first understood broadly, it was seen as very profound. Um, and I think even today, people think of it. Many people think of it as a as in some sense of a, a, you know a problem, not just a fact of mathematics, which. You know, it, it, it is a fact of mathematics. Everything that's true in mathematics is, is a fact of mathematics. But many people perceive this to be a problem. You know, they, they have emotional valence associated with this thing. Um, does it make sense to refer to or to think of incompleteness as a, a problem rather than just a fact like any other? Oh, I see. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, I don't view it as a problem. It's a theorem. It's a fundamental fact of the nature of mathematical reality is how I think about it. I mean, and that one is advised to take it on board because we've, we've established <laughs> its truth. It's a fundamental feature. I remember uh, I, my doctoral supervisor was Hugh Wooden, who was at Berkeley at the time, but now at Harvard. And I admire him very much. But one of the things that I admire most about him was his ability to take on board new results immediately and then start using them. He incorporated the new things into his thinking. And I observed this many times, you know, interacting with him in our weekly meetings and whatever. And, you know, I would bring in a proof of something that he hadn't known about. And then immediately, you know, uh, uh, he was doing X, Y, Z and making further steps in a way that I hadn't, as a young uh, young mathematician at the time, I wasn't sort of up to speed with 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 doing that. But what I, I learned that how important it was to take on board this sort of new knowledge and then proceed further from it. And so that's sort of how I think about it: is one if one is just uh, in the state of looking at it as a kind of uh, profound mystery, but the, the doesn't. Um, uh, take the further steps that would flow with the knowledge that the incompleteness theorem is a fundamental phenomenon, then I think you're, you would be missing out. So, so I guess I would kind of reject the proposal that you just made and rather take it fully on board. Incompleteness theorem is a fundamental nature of mathematical reality. We just can't have a computable maximization of 
even arithmetic truth. And all kinds of things flow from that. It means, for example, I mean, the second incompleteness theorem is a kind of refinement of the first incompleteness theorem. It says that no, uh, no computably axiomatizable theory can prove its own consistency. This is one of the statements that you're not going to be able to prove, is the statement that the theory itself is consistent. And that leads immediately, if you follow this process that I'm saying, to the consistency hierarchy. Namely, you have a theory that you like, maybe it's piano arithmetic. That theory is not going to prove its own consistency, which is presumably something that you believe is true, because you like the theory, so you should probably think the theory is consistent too. So therefore, we can add the consistency assertion to the theory. That's going to give us a stronger theory. If that theory doesn't prove its consistency, so we would add the consistency assertion of that one as well. That makes another third theory a stronger one. And so when we keep adding the consistency assertion, that makes a stronger and stronger theory. We get this hierarchy of theories. Okay, you might say, well, we just, that's it. We made the consistency hierarchy and we would be done at that stage. But that's not true, because if I, if I look at the, the resulting infinite extension of adding all of those consistency assertions at every finite stage, that's a perfectly good theory also, which is computably axiomatizable. And it is also incomplete and doesn't prove its consistency. And so we go to step omega, omega plus one, omega plus two, and so on, into the ordinals. We get this enormously tall hierarchy, this consistency tower. And so Gödel's theorem is saying, look, whatever your theory is, there's going to be this tower of consistency theories that are stronger than it, towering over it. And then we can look at other parts of mathematics and we can see sometimes we have these sort of towers of theories and we can prove even, like for example, in the large cardinal hierarchy, we can prove that certain parts of this hierarchy instantiate this increase in consistency strength. So higher theories in the tower are proving the consistency of lower levels of the tower and so on in a very natural way. So these are sort of naturally arising towers of theories that are getting stronger and, and they instantiate this phenomenon that's totally predicted by the, uh, the second incompleteness theorem and the tower of consistency strength. One of the things you said there was was uh, you know interesting. This idea of of kind of creating a hierarchy um, of basically kind of adding things in to our sort of mathematical formalism in order to prove consistency at lower levels. And in some sense, I think for many people, this would feel almost like kind of plugging holes or re, uh, kind of um, resorting to things outside of. Um, what's absolutely necessary, you know, the, the mathematical system is absolutely necessary. Um, and kind of adding fragility, I guess, to the system, you know, you, you, you continue have to build something more complex, build on top, build on top. And I, I think many people do worry that, you know, in, in the grand edifice of mathematics, we, we now have a completely unwieldy, very large, complex system on which, um, you know, many things that we think are true depend and uh, there's kind of no one around who can have the full picture in mind and, and have full confidence that there aren't these, these holes floating around. Is this something that concerns you at all? That, you know, we've, we've, we've grown mathematics uh, into something that's very, very large and beyond the, beyond the, the comprehension of any one individual and, uh, you know, running at full speed down, uh, down many paths. Um, but down, down at bottom, you know, <laughs> low down the hierarchy, there, there might be things that we're missing. There might be things that we, we have wrong. Is that, is that something that concerns you at all? Right. I guess, it, I guess it does. I mean, there's sort of two aspects. I mean, I'm going to sort of pull apart in your question. Namely, I don't really view this building of the hierarchy as plugging holes in the way that you describe. But, but rather it's, it's sort of opening us up to to realize that there's this sort of beautiful new land awaiting for our, us to explore. I mean, the fact of the matter is that even a century ago, as I said, all almost all of the elementary number theory is provable, you know, at the bottom level. We already knew that. The, we, we, we could prove so much in that base theory that we thought it might be complete, right? This was 
the, the question that the incompleteness theorem is answering, right? And the, the discovery that it's not complete, you know, means that there's these statements that are true in the natural number structure, but not provable on the basis of those axioms. And these statements are very hard to come by, but when you find them, they're fascinating. Um, and not just about the consistency statements, but the sort of other instances of, of independence. And, and when you can say that a statement is definitely independent, this is a kind of fascinating situation which greatly enlarges your mathematical understanding. So, so it's not at all plugging a hole. Rather, it's sort of revealing this higher realm that you would have totally missed if you hadn't been undertaking this process. And so that's the sense in which I'm not at all concerned. Um, uh, about it. I mean, for example, in this sort of set theoretic realm, as opposed to arithmetic, then we have the zermelo frankel uh, axioms of set theory, which were, you know, s set up in 1904 or so. And um, uh, uh, and uh, and we've now observed that um, an enormous variety of statements are known to be not settleable in the basis of the standard axioms of set theory. For example, the continuum hypothesis and the axiom of choice can't be settled from the other axioms and, and Lusin's hypothesis and, and uh, uh, existence of large cardinals and uh, Susan's hypothesis and so on. There's an enormous variety, hundreds, thousands of different mathematical statements that are independent of CFC. And the normal expectation is that uh, basically, any statement in infinite combinatorics is either trivial or else it's independent of ZFC. That's the kind of experience that we have. So many statements are not settleable in the axiom um, of, of set theory that way. So, um, but there was another aspect to your question, which is about like whether one person can be master of all of mathematics, and that's. Uh, Mathematics is just too vast today uh, for sort of a single person really to, to uh, ha have the survey of the whole uh, subject. It's just impossible. It's too big. Um, I mean, even you can't even know all of logic or all of, you know, algebra or something like this. So the, those subjects in, individually are also so vast and, and the mathematics has become so specialized. I mean, uh, I don't view it as a, as a problem, that's going to be the nature of any extremely successful intellectual endeavor, right? Once the amount of knowledge in the subject is so enormous, it's, it, of course, it, it's going to uh, uh, have areas that are more specialized than others and so on. And it just won't be possible for a person to be expert in all those different specialized areas. So it's not particularly concerning. It's just the nature of, of, I think any intellectual activity that's extremely successful and has produced so much knowledge that there's just too much of it for one person to be the master of. Yeah, yeah. Um, you you mentioned uh, a couple a couple minutes ago so, you know, se several axioms. Um, you know the ax the continuum hypothesis, the, and then you mentioned the um, the axiom of choice. So there is a famous example that I think is well known amongst physicists or, or mathematicians would know it as well. But physicists are familiar with this one. In geometry, where I can't remember which of the which of the five axioms of, of geometry was, I think it was probably the fifth one. I, I, exactly, exactly. So yeah, you know, five five axioms of geometry that all make a lot of intuitive sense, and that um, you know we built a whole edifice of of geometry off of the back of, um, with the fifth one being uh, some some statement to the to the to the effect of so you have a line and a, and a point. Uh, off off that line, there is a unique line that's parallel to the first that passes through that point, and it, it feels it feels very intuitive. But people worried about this for a long time, and, and nonetheless, you know, whole theories of geometry were, were built off of this, and they had implications in physics and and elsewhere. And at some point, this uh, this um, this axiom was was relaxed, and and new types of geometry emerged, and these turned out to be very important. You know, they turned out to be to be very important for our understanding of um, space-time, for example. But that, but that's w w one example of of this idea where um, you know we have be because of how we've evolved and and the world we live in, we develop intuitions for for axioms um, as to you know w what should be what should be true in in something that's a useful piece of mathematics uh, and. 
and it turns out that we could in some sense be mistaken and um you know the 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 uh, the axiom of choice uh, for me there stood out as 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 one potential example of that because it is used in so many other parts of of mathematics um but that's the type of thing that I was that I was referring to when I was worrying you know we were building grand edifices on on things that at the end of the day re- rely on on intuition you know at, at the end of the day when push comes to shove at bottom there is an intuitive choice being made does that concern you well, I mean, of course, everything concerns me, I guess. So there's a debate <laughs> in the philosophy of set theory about the nature of the various axioms of mathematics, and in particular, the axioms of set theory. And, and one of the common distinctions that's made is the distinction between what's called intrinsic justification for an axiom versus extrinsic justification for an axiom. And, and the idea is that an axiom enjoys intrinsic support or intrinsic justification if if the axiom is expressing a fundamental idea that, that we can see, you know, to, to use this sort of uh, you know, intuitive language that you were just mentioning, I think it's, it's most like, tightly connected with, with that idea. When, when, when we, it's part of the nature of the concepts that we're, that we're talking about, that this principle should be true. Um, so, for example, in set theory, the axiom of extensionality is the assertion that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same members. And this is expressing a sort of core idea about what we mean by sets. I mean, the, what we mean by a set is it's a collection of objects. And so if you, have, if you have a set X and another set Y and they have the same members, then they're the same set. That's sort of what we mean by sets. And the axiom of extensionality is expressing that idea in a quite clear way. Um, and and therefore, it's enjoying intrinsic support. But other axioms enjoy what's called extrinsic support, and maybe it's sort of consequentialist support. We can, on the basis of the axiom, we can prove a lot of things that say generalize known things. Um, and so we might say, well, look, that's a reason to believe in the axiom if it's it's almost a scientific way of proceeding, right? You're saying, look, this axiom implies all these things that we like very much and that we know are true in many, many instances. And so it's a kind of consequentialist. We, we judge the truth of the, of the original axiom on the basis of uh, that it's correctly making these predictions, right? Sort of like experimental evidence a little bit. Um, and it's fundamentally different in character a, a, a fundamentally different way, reason to accept an axiom if it has this extrinsic support only. But so it's sort of like you think it's probably true, but you don't really know why. It, you know, but it has all these consequences that you want to keep, and it's a way, a unifying way of organizing those consequences. And so maybe that's reason to believe that it's true. Sometimes people talk about the axiom of choice as having this extrinsic support, namely, uh, it's very useful in mathematics. It's used all over the subject, as you mentioned, and, uh, and, and so we find all these consequences of it that give us, you know, that we like and that give us reason to, to believe in it. But my view is that actually the principal reason and principal justification for the axiom of choice is, is one that's intrinsic. Namely, we have this idea of sort of arbitrary collection of objects. So the axiom of choice says if you have a family of of such sets, then there's a way of choosing an element, one from each each member of the family. And so if if we have, say, a family of disjoint sets, then there should be a set whose intersection with those sets in each case has exactly one element, the choice set formulation. And... And the intrinsic way of thinking about this is that, well, of course there should be such a set because I don't care how the choices are made. And my conception of the, what sets there are is that sets come sort of in all possible patterns and ways, regardless of whether they're following a definition or a procedure or whether they're constructive in some way, uh, that all of the sets, whether they're constructive or not, are part of the sort of set theoretic realm and so one of those sets is going to be the one that you know a a set that makes such kind of choices and that's why one could believe the axiom of choice on intrinsic grounds um 
And so, so it's a kind of debate, though, about uh, you know, why do we believe in axioms? Why should we believe in axioms? What are the grounds for accepting one axiom rather than another? And furthermore, what does it really mean to accept an axiom? Because does it mean you can never reason from a different incompatible axiom again? What if you want the axiom choice on Monday, but then on Tuesday you want to look at you know, consequences of the failure of the axiom of choice, then it becomes incoherent if you're insisting still in keeping the axiom of choice on the Tuesday, right? And so what does it mean to adopt an axiom? Does it mean forever that you have to use those axioms and only those ones? Or, or well, it, that seems absurd. It seems like we can reason in different theories in different times. And and maybe it's not so urgent to like have a final list that's you know the the official list of axioms that we're going to use. Rather, we just have a lot of different theories, and sometimes we use some of them, and sometimes we use the others. And depending on you know the nature of our argument, or whether we need to use the axiom in our argument, or or what we what we feel like doing, why not that way, right? So it seems like maybe there isn't so much urgency in settling. Uh, uh, what the sort of final official list of axioms should be, and that we can be more kind of open-minded about what kind of mathematical theories we're you know, willing to undertake investigations in. Mm. I, I do, I do question the that uh, um, sort of dichotomy between intrinsic versus extrinsic to some extent, and whether it, it, that really truly can be decoupled from basically the human mind the, the way we think about things so for for, for example if i were to take a, a statement that almost everyone would have the strongest uh, sort of gut belief that it is true you know one plus one equals two everyone understands that to be true and uh, you know i understand to, to to actually formally prove that is is quite some work but you know it's a statement that people could to take to be true um but if I took, you know, two 60-digit numbers and multiplied them together and displayed the answer, that would be true in just the same way. So independently of humans, that, that answer would be true in the same way. But um, almost nobody would have anything like the same level of intuition for, for that statement being true. And so I do, I do wonder if the, um, you know, the, the truth value of, I mean, you know, we want to choose axioms that are useful. Um, and uh, it's basically our intelligence that lets us um, sort of intuit which are the right ones. And you know, if we were if we were vastly more intelligent, the the two sixty digit numbers being multiplied together, and that answer that would be intuitive in the same way as, as a one as a one plus one equals two is is yeah, intuitive to most people. And so it it does feel to me that those two concepts that you mentioned there sort of are are related. But the 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 the, the through line it seems to be some sort of level of intelligence, some hu human understanding. Um, you know, give, given a sufficiently smart person, um, things that uh, would be, would have this quality of, of being extrinsically true, um, feel like they would fall into the intrinsic bucket. W what do you, what do you think there, the, the, the relationship between the human mind um, and the um, mathematical truth of um, or the, the selection of uh, of the axioms of so um, I'm not, mathematics. I want to push against your, you know, what you said a little bit, um, because it seems to me that this intrinsic extrinsic is kind of getting at this human way of thinking. I mean, in the dispute between intrinsic justification and extrinsic justification, there's there's the idea that look, it's the intrinsically justified ones. That's a better justification. It's a more satisfactory one. But we don't, we can't always achieve it because some of our axioms don't seem to be intrinsically justified and they only have this extrinsic support, which is a kind of a lesser kind of support. But what it means to be intrinsically justified means that the truth of it is something that is intuitively the case. And so it fits into your, in, your intuitive category. The way I think about it is to provide intrinsic support for an axiom is to explain, you know, why it's part of our human understanding of the concept in a very direct way. And that's what it means to have intrinsic support for the axiom. Whereas the extrinsic support happens, or we care about it really, only when we're not able to achieve this intrinsic one. You know? 
And so maybe there are mathematical statements and our intuition is failing us. We don't, we can't tell if it's true or not. But if it has extrinsic support, that's still evidence. We, you know, we have this conundrum. We want to know, should we adopt this axiom anyway, even though we can't intuit whether it's part of the concept or not? And, and this is a very common thing in, you know, when you're in this sort of very strong theories in set theory or whatever, um, it, you know, you have mathematical principles that are expressing a clear idea, but you don't know if it's true or not. Uh, but you can fall back on this extrinsic support as a way of, of, um, of, of you know, trying to answer the question whether that principle is true or not. And so, uh, so I don't think it's actually so different from this sort of intuitive way that you were talking. It's just that's the intrinsic support category. And it's a pity. It's this kind of uh, regrettable fact that there are many mathematical statements that we can't tell if they're true or not. And so we're struggling to, to see, well, should we adopt them or their negation as an axiom? Or do we think they're true or not? And so we're sort of forced to find other means of deciding such questions. And extrinsic support is one way of talking about that. I mean, ultimately, the question, if you have a statement and it's independent in the way that the parallel postulate is independent. So that's what we're really talking about. We have a very strong theory, say, zermelo franco set theory, or strengthenings of it. And we have statements that are neither provable nor refutable, just like the parallel postulate is neither provable nor refutable from the other axioms of geometry. And one way of proving that a statement is independent is to exhibit models in which the statement is true or in which the statement is false, but all the other statements are, are true in both cases. And that exists in geometry. For example, we have Euclidean geometry, which satisfies all the geometry axioms, including the parallel postulate. And then we have these various non-Euclidean geometries like hyperbolic space or spherical geometry, Riemannian sphere, and so on, in which all the axioms are true except for the parallel postulate, which is false in these non-Euclidean geometries. So we have these models, and they satisfy all the axioms except the one that's independent, and in one case it's true, and in another case it's false. And that exact same thing happens in set theory. For example, we can give models of set theory where all the zermelo franco axioms are true, including, say, the axiom of choice, but the continuum hypothesis is true in one and false in another, and, and therefore the continuum hypothesis is independent. So we can often make these kind of independence, uh, prove these independence results. It's pervasive, the independence phenomenon. And for many of these independent statements, we just don't know if it's true or not. Should we take them as true or not? And so we, we're grappling with the question, and so we... Um, uh, it's a non-mathematical question because the statement is independent. We can't prove it or refute it. So we're not going to answer it by proof. It has to be some other sort of philosophical justification or reason to adopt the statement or its negation or to, or to study both or neither. Or mm -hmm. um, That's how it goes. Yeah, I guess at the, at the, at the bottom of it, in, in examples like that, um, you know, an aspect of it is just <laughs> which which paths do humans find interesting? What what paths are we drawn to? Which areas of mathematics do we explore? Because I mean, you mentioned it earlier, it is so vast and in fact infinitely vast in some unimaginable way. And so, you know, human mathematicians do have to make a choice. Um, and it's it's not quite the same way in in sort of more practical sciences. That that, that choice is often driven by things out in the real world. You know, uh, a cancer researcher. Um, you know, it, it, it's the, the motivation for studying uh, oncology. It can be can be justified in in many ways. The the motivation for choosing a particular area of um, pure mathematics to study something that's very abstract, far removed from practicalities of life. Uh, it, it's it's a sort of a, a more nuanced and, and complex thing. And an answer that you would hear a, a lot of the time from people in these fields is, you know, it's it's. Um, the, the sense of, of beauty, of um, the, the intricateness of it all, uh, it, it, it sort of feels like it's touching something deep within people. Um, I, have, I have a question for you, for you there, firstly, if, if you sort of feel the same way and, and like, you know, that is what's drawn you to the questions that, that you look at and you study. But I also have a, a follow-up question, um, sort of the more general question is, you know, how, how do you think about how 
mathematicians should be choosing the areas to investigate in such an abstract realm? You know, by, by what criteria um, should we be um, deciding which questions to pursue and not, given that these are often very far removed from practicalities of of life, at least in the near term, at least in the foreseeable. Right. So that's a, a very difficult question to answer. I mean, for my own part, I mean, let me just answer personally. Uh, I've always followed the practice of working on whatever mathematical questions I find interesting. And that's mm. basically the only criteria. If I find it interesting or if I'm curious about a mathematical phenomenon, I want to get, you know, I want to understand it more deeply. I want to gain some insight into some mathematical context or something. Then that's enough for me. I just work on it. And, and I try to adopt and I recommend to all my students, including undergraduate students, this kind of idea of playing with one's ideas. And I think this is true in any realm, not just mathematics, but I always say, look, you just play around with your ideas. Maybe you have, you learn a new concept. Well, then you should play around with it. You should look at examples and tweak things a little bit and put them together and see what happens. Or can you make uh, observations or deduce consequences, you know? And, and, and I think it's so important um, for making advances in, in, in these intellectual uh, realms that if, to have people that are playing Okay, but it also means, I mean, sort of personally, it, it has meant that I've often worked on some kind of non-standard or quirky topics that aren't part of the mainstream. I mean, it's sort of what I'm a little bit known for, not like totally wacky things, but sort of unusual topics. And for example, let me just give an example. I spent a long time, a lot of work studying um, infinite computation, infinite time Turing machines is the paper that I wrote with Andy Lewis. And I had started this when I was a grad student still. I was still a student and I was working on it then. Um, and I had just got my PhD and left and, and I was uh, thinking about whether to like really get more deeply into it and develop the theory much more fully. And I had talked to various colleagues and so on and some of them told me not to do it. And, and I really thought a lot about it, and I decided, well, to hell with them. I, I think it's interesting, and I'm going to do it. And I did it. And now this paper is my most highly cited paper. It has hundreds of citations, and, and there's been dozens of master's theses written on this topic and PhD dissertations written you know, following up, and many, many dozens of papers written following up on this thing and conferences and so on. And so it's one of my most successful projects ever. And, and I'm really glad that I did it because, first of all, it's super interesting, and I really learned a lot, and I learned from other people who, you know, took the ideas further and all of that was just fascinating and <clears throat> and and so if people tell you not to work on something because you know of some reason having to do with uh, expectations or something then my advice is to just ignore that totally and work on whatever you're interested in there's another example my son when he was in i don't remember what it was third grade or something like that they were learning about prime numbers in his school and his teachers sent home this exercise. And the question was, um, <clears throat> can you think of a number which is prime and has digits that add up to 10 and it has a three in the tens place? Okay, that was the question. And probably the teacher was thinking about two digit numbers. <laughs> because 37 is prime and the digits add to 10 and it has a three in the tens place. And it's the only two digit number like that. I mean, it would have to be sort of redundant because if the digits add to 10 and it's two digits and it has a three in tens place, then the other one has to be a seven. And so it would have to be 37 anyway. So, um, but it wasn't stated in the question, two digits. And so my son and I were at the cafe and I said, well, what about three digit numbers and so on? And uh, let me just look here. We have uh, right, 433 is prime, and it adds up to 10, and also 631, and 1,531. 
and also uh, 100,333. And, and so I, I went to this list of primes, you know, up to a billion or whatever, and, and found more and more instances. Of course, they have to have lots of zeros when they have many digits in order for the digits to still add up to 10. Most of the digits are going to have to be zero. And I, I wasn't, I, and I realized, well, how many examples are there? And I just didn't know. And I didn't even know like what methods one would use to prove that there are infinitely many or are not. And so I asked on a math stack exchange this question, um, uh, you know, how can we come to know this? And then pretty soon people were posting answers like these with these hundred digit primes, two hundred digit primes with mostly zeros, but the digits added up to ten and it had a three in the ten space and so on. And so there was this international sort of collaborative effort to produce more and more huge examples of the, the answering my son's uh, uh, second grade teacher or fourth grade or whatever it was. Let's see, fourth grade, I guess, in the notes here. Um, and so, uh, so that's an example of play. You know, it's this sort of silly example, but actually it got into these, what I view as quite sophisticated ideas about how one can, can come to... Uh, analyze such kind of number theoretic assertions. And, and as far as I know, it's still an open question whether or not there are infinitely many examples uh, of that phenomenon or not. So I recommend play. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful example of, um, yeah, I mean, it play following, following what naturally draws us. And I mean, very often historically, if you look at the, the um, progress of mathematics, that has actually led to things that have also been very of great practical use, um, whether in in sciences or even just more generally, and um, and I think that often often when when one is asked um, of the value of studying these these very abstract mathematical questions, um, one one answer given is often that you know we we don't know of the practical use that might come out of it in the future. Uh, another side of the coin is is often. That it doesn't matter, and one does not need to apologize for for what they're studying. One doesn't ask the composer, "What's the practical use of your symphony?" Or the mm -hmm. artist, you know, is it going to help us make a better toaster? Your work of art, will it help make better toasters? I mean, you know, we—that's a kind of demand that we just don't put on the artists or the novelists or the other great thinkers. So, what? Why? Why should it be required that in order for mathematicians to justify, you know, spending a lot of time working out their ideas, that it should lead to some practical thing? I just don't agree with that principle in the first place. And I think it's a kind of cultural achievement that <clears throat> we're coming to understand in a deep way these mathematical questions that have confused people for centuries. Mm -hmm. And now we are coming to understand them in a very deep and profound way. And this is cultural advance. And it doesn't need these practical applications, as far as I'm concerned, in order to justify it. No, it happens that mathematics is happens to be very useful and, and, and has many, many practical applications. But still, I'm going to be studying infinite chess and infinite computation and infinite other things. Uh, even if they don't have any applications, which probably those examples don't. Um, but still, they're interesting, and there's open questions to be looked into, and they're fascinating, and I encourage anyone who's interested in those questions to join me and and take a look, and let's figure it out together. Yeah, I, I fully agree, and um, and certainly, you know, one does not need to, to sort of justify these pursuits to others, but I do think it's important for for one to to think about their own motivations for themselves at least in a in a clear-eyed way, um, one one analogy that comes to mind here is um, you know we we are drawn to these questions um, basically like if you if you boil it down it's it's due to the constitution of our minds and <laughs> it was not evolved to do mathematics necessarily it was evolved for lots of other things. Um, and if I, if I took the, the the sort of toy example of letting a child loose in a, in a sort of grocery store, they um, they would tend to naturally gravitate towards the the um, like the candy aisle, for example, and um, and they 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 don't yet have the 
perspective of sort of the, 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 the broader perspective of what they want to be doing with their lives. There's sort of like evolutionary impulses to draw them towards certain, uh, <laughs> certain parts of that store and they're, they're drawn towards the candy aisle. I do sometimes wonder if um, in the pursuit of, um, you know, questions of the abstract questions whether we're, we're we're like children being being drawn to towards the candy are you know drawn by interest and drawn by play and uh, maybe not putting enough um of a um of an emphasis onto where that motivation is coming from within the mind um i think i think fortunately it seems to to bear fruit and to to lead to to good places uh but i but i do i do wonder um you know, our minds were not evolved to do to do mathematics. And what really is it that we're being drawn to? You know, is it is it um, is it is it is possible that we're sort of uh, fumbling around in the in the candy aisle of, of some mental space and missing the missing the fruits and vegetables, missing something that actually could um, could be more meaningful? Do you, do you do you sort of think about the the questions you focus on in in that sort of way at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally do. Um, I mean, I don't think. They, I mean, I work on a lot of different topics, um, and I don't. I wouldn't say any of them are, are are frivolous. Although the book I'm writing about infinite games is called Infinite Games: Frivolities of the Gods, because I'm really <laughs> looking at infinite chess and infinite drafts and infinite hex and. Uh, uh, sort of infinitary versions of all of our uh, familiar games, um, but but it's kind of an excuse because really what's going on in in even that sort of frivolous seeming topic is a kind of uh, careful analysis of the nature of strategy and game and uh, strategic reasoning and so on in this infinitary realm, and I think one gets insight. Um, uh, you know, that, that sort of is larger than the particular games that are studied, the sort of unifying principles and, um, and, and, and so on, that are kind of unifying our understanding of the nature of strategic reasoning in, mm. in, in these infinitary realms. And, and, and furthermore, there's even sort of consequences to foundational issues when you get into the axiom of determinacy and so on, which has profound mathematical consequences and actually extremely strong consistency strength it's an instance of having very high consistency strength um, so it it builds this connection with these other deeper philosophical questions about in the foundations of mathematics and and so so even though it started off you know seeming to be possibly frivolous or weird but yet it's it builds into this subject which is building these um, uh, insightful, uh, consequences with with fundamental questions on the nature of mathematical reality, and 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 that happens again and again and again, and it happens so much that it you can you can almost sort of count on it in in logic in mathematical logic, in particular. Then it's pretty likely that questions are going to you know be having these deep connections with something really fundamental, and so it's easy to f- find justification sort of on. On, on those ma- very general mathematical grounds for for almost any of these questions in the subject, um, it used to be you know 150 years ago, when you go back and look, people were hopelessly confused about the nature of truth and proof, and they maybe didn't even distinguish between those very carefully. Even in the early 20th century, it's shocking how much confusion there was in the writings of people about proof and truth. But nowadays, we're totally clear on this in part because of the, you know, the formal analysis of these notions that's risen from mathematical logic and philosophical logic. And, and so it's adding so much clarity and depth to our understanding of the nature of the foundational questions um, that one, you know, we can't help but think that there's huge progress in, 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 in those realms. Hmm. And the uh, the other great benefit I think uh, that you sort of alluded to is um, that I think the other other people are also finding this very joyful and fun. And I, I know you've got a, a very interesting online presence, uh, both um, on your, on Substack and and in various books, which 
um, people are finding a lot of value in. Maybe we can turn to, as we sort of bring it towards a close towards what you're what you're doing there. I think for for the past year or so, or at least this year, you've uh, been serializing a very interesting book on Substack. Why don't you why don't you tell us about that uh, that book and your endeavors there? It's the the book of infinity. So I started my Substack in in January of this year and. It's because I was teaching a new class called Infinity. Uh, it's a sort of undergraduate level class for uh, uh, students here at Notre Dame to fulfill. Actually, they can fulfill the second philosophy requirement that way. Um, and so I had a whole bunch of STEM majors and different all different majors um, uh, mixed in in that class. And and uh, and so I decided because the the book I wanted to teach them. <laughs> was you know being written during while the course was proceeding and so I was uh, uh, always a bit ahead and posting the chapters on the substack as they uh, were completed and and everything went really well and so I was able to cover all of my favorite conundrums and paradoxes and puzzles and and examples including a lot of historical stuff um, um, uh, going back to Aristotle and Archimedes and so on, Zeno's paradox and a lot of Galileo and uh, and then getting into uh, more contemporary things as well, but also, of course, Cantor and Gödel and everybody. Um, so it, it was really quite a lot of fun, the Book of Infinity. And the, the name of the substack is infinitelymore.xyz. If you go to infinitelymore.xyz, you can find all the books there. And I'm I'm not I'm still putting new material into the Book of Infinity. Um, there's going to be a chapter released soon on the surreal numbers, and I've also begun serializing the another uh, separate book project called Panorama of Logic, which is a kind of introduction to uh, topics in logic, um, and uh, and that's proceeding. And also my my book on infinite games will be serialized there, and I have another project uh, also. Uh, math for seven-year-olds, uh, which is a bunch of uh, projects that I have developed over the years, um, sort of activities to undertake with young uh, people who are interested in mathematics. I used to go into my son's school and my daughter's school and do little math projects with the students in the classes. And so I have these collections of various things and I'm going to put them all together and put them on the substack. Math for seven-year-olds. But actually, it's for people of any age. <laughs> The the last one is um, you know we've we've talked a bit about uh, intelligence and we've definitely talked a lot about intelligent people and uh, one of the topics that's very widely discussed at the moment is uh, the the concept of AI superintelligence and whether and when we'll be we'll be visited by an AI, AI superintelligence. Uh, my question to you is um, if you were to imagine that we would be and you had to elect or or pick one representative from humanity uh, either past or present to to represent us to that ai superintelligence who comes to mind who, who would you who would you pick well i mean of course there's huge numbers of people that i admire very much uh in my subject but also artists and so on i mean i think maybe it would uh might be a kind of mistake to try to sort of pick an extremely smart person the smartest person that i know maybe isn't necessarily the best person for such a kind of task, right? So I remember this essay that I read once in a while that um, um, an alien intelligence comes to Earth in uh, sort of a kind of oracle and offers to answer any question, any one question that would be asked. And so humanity was supposed to organize and, and decide which question would be put to the oracle, right? And at first, people were proposing questions. You know, so there was a kind of conference that was held to discuss the proposals and, and uh, you know, ultimately to decide. And, and people were proposing sort of engineering kind of questions or medical questions, you know, like cure, cure, what's the cure to cancer or something of that nature. Or, um, but then there was, well, what if there isn't actually a cure to cancer, then the, you know, the answer won't be so useful to us. And then someone had the idea, well, why don't we ask, what is the answer to the best possible question that we can ask? And, and people said, yeah, that's great, because it'll be, you know, whatever the best question is, then that answer will be really useful to us. But then people objected and said, well, no, if we just ask it like that, then maybe the answer is going to be, you know, 42 or something, and we won't know what the question is. And so the proposal was made 
the, the question should be, what is the ordered pair whose first entry <laughs> is the best question that we could possibly yeah. ask and whose second entry is the answer to that question? And, and this had almost unanimous support at the conference. That that's the question that we should ask. Okay, and so it was voted on and approved, and that was the final question. And so they put it to the oracle. And the oracle, you know, beamed down or whatever, however it was, uh, and, and answered the question and said, the ordered pair whose first element is the best possible question you could ask me and whose second coordinate is the answer to that question is the ordered pair cons- whose first coordinate is the question that you, in fact, asked and <laughs> whose, answer, whose second coordinate is the answer which I am now <laughs> so, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that so hilarious. Uh-oh. But also it, it brings up, you know, this question of like who to pick. Well, it's not who you think. It's gonna involve skills that really don't have anything to do with intelligence or something. It, 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 it's really some other kind of criteria that one should be thinking about uh, to select the representative of humanity for such a purpose in my view well that's a that's a very uplifting and lovely place to end it i think um joel thank you so much for making the time to speak to me it's been an absolute pleasure pleasure. yeah thank you so much for inviting thanks for listening to this episode of the paradigm podcast if you're enjoying this podcast please subscribe on youtube and give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast player this goes a long way towards increasing our visibility and that helps us attract even more fantastic guests. You can also head on over to our website where you'll be able to submit questions for our guests, get access to special Ask Me Anything episodes, and some other nice perks. The Paradigm Podcast is free, but donations are very much welcome. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me again next time.